We're going to be reading from the Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer 60. Question and answer 60 asks, how are you righteous before God? Only by true faith in Jesus Christ, even though my conscience accuses me of having grievously sinned against all God's commandments, of never having kept any of them, and of still being inclined toward all evil, nevertheless, without any merit of my own, out of sheer grace, God grants and credits to me the perfect satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ, as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner, and as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. Gift with a believing heart. I didn't see the words on the next page. Sorry about that. Our scripture reading, we have just one verse. We're going to be referring to a whole bunch of other verses, but one verse from Hebrews 11. We've been going through Ephesians for the, the second service as we look at um, the armor of God and going through Hebrews in the first service as we look at faith and the heroes of faith as we find them in the Old Testament. So Hebrews 11 Verse 7, we're looking at Noah this morning, and as I said, I'll be doing a lot of references from Genesis as well as elsewhere. So Hebrews 11, verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Let us pray. Lord, we have heard just one verse from your holy word that we're going to be looking at today with lots of references to elsewhere in scripture. But as we look at this faith of Noah, may our faith be directed past him to faith in Jesus. In whose name we pray, amen. Now, as I already mentioned, we can't look, congregation, we can't look at Noah in Hebrews without also looking at Noah in Genesis. So I want to start off with Genesis chapter 6. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark. Genesis 6. God announced he was going to send a flood. And by faith, says Hebrews, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. God made an announcement. God made a command. And by faith, Noah responded. He responded concerning events as yet unseen. That phrase, events as yet unseen, should sound familiar to all of us as we've been going through Hebrews chapter 11. Because what did Hebrews start off with? Its definition of faith or description of faith. Faith is what? The assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Noah, build an ark. I'm sending a flood. Noah didn't see anything. And yet by filth, by faith, he built. 
Why did Noah build that ark? Did he see big, big storm clouds on the horizon? You know, we saw that as we were coming here this morning. Big clouds over the mountains. We hope they'll bring lots of rain and lots of snow. Is that when he began building the ark, when he saw big clouds in the sky? Big, dark, angry clouds? A couple of weeks ago, I kept getting emergency alerts on my phone. You know, you can get those on your phone. And I was being warned about flash flooding in Tulare County. Did Noah build an ark because he got a, some kind of weather alert? Did Noah do what we do and turn on the weather channel and see bad weather was coming? Did he have a, climate, a climatologist on staff who warned him about global warming or global cooling or climate change? You know, that's all the kind of stuff that we use and do. But the answer is no to all of that. Noah had faith in what he did not see. So why exactly did Noah build the ark? He took God at his word. He recognized the authority of God's word. God said to Noah, Noah, I'm going to destroy the world. You better build an ark to save yourself and your family and two of all living creatures. So Noah obeyed in reverent fear, we are told by Hebrews he built. In reverent fear, Noah constructed an ark for the saving of his household. Reverent fear, holy fear, reverence for God, reverence for the word of God. Noah took God at his word. He had faith in what he did not see. Now, in building the ark, Noah's faith is nothing less than remarkable. My wife and I are, with our son, are fixing up a home right now. And you'd be surprised the number of times we go to the hardware store or to the lumber yard and pick up what we need. I don't think Noah had that option. There are some who suspect that life was way more advanced back then than we possibly realize it to be, but I doubt if there was a hardware store or a lumber yard. He couldn't order planks and beams and nails and pitch. One of the greatest acts of faith in the history of the world began when Noah picked up an axe and chopped down his first tree. What faith? And you know how long it took him to build that ark? A hundred years of building. Normal people would have stopped. Maybe after a couple months, six months, maybe a year or two. Well, I don't see what God was talking about. I don't see any clouds on the horizon. What is this? But Noah kept on working for 20 years and 50 years and 70 years and 90 years and over 100 years. And miles from any ocean in his backyard. That's faith. Noah had never seen a storm like the one that was coming. And again, there were some that say that he had never seen a storm, period. That the climate of the world totally changed after the flood. Maybe, maybe not. We're not told that. And what did Noah know about boat building? Nothing. 
No, I had never seen a boat as big as the one that God told them to build. Let me remind you of its dimensions. 450 feet long, 73 feet wide, 44 feet high. You know, we have something across the street that's just a little bit bigger. The Save Mart Center. What would you think if God said to you, okay, go. Build something just a little bit smaller than that Save Mart Center. What faith? And he coated the inside with pitch and the outside to keep the waters of judgment out. That's Noah's faith. Responding in obedience, responding in faithfulness to the word of God. And when it was finished, this boat, this ark, this ship was missing a bunch of things that we would expect. No rudder, no source of power, no sail, nothing at all to control it. No, I had to trust that when the flood came, God was going to look after things. And what about the animals? In Genesis 6, God said something about two of each kind, and we know that in actual fact, there were seven of some of the clean animals, or all of the clean animals. How are they going to be looked after for over a year? How are they going to be collected? How are they going to be fed? Who is going to clean the stalls? What faith? And try to imagine what the other people back then were thinking and saying. Ah, crazy Noah. Look at what he's doing. And I bet you people came and looked in his backyard at this monster boat and they would wonder if it would even float. And they'd smile and mock about a boat being built so far from water. What faith. Now our ark is Christ. And the pitch that secures us that keeps the waters of judgment out is the blood of Christ. Do you believe this? Like Noah, do you take God at his word? Do you have faith like Noah and what you don't see? And when God comes calling like Noah, do you obey? I hope so and I pray so. Our text tells us Noah condemned the world. That's our second point. By his faith, he condemned the world. Peter uses an interesting phrase here in 2 Peter. Peter says Noah is a herald of righteousness. That means he was a preacher. I was telling my cycling friend Rod about Enoch again. He had mentioned to me, yeah, I watched last week's service. I watched what you heard, what you said about Enoch. And I can't believe there was a preacher back then. I said, well, he wasn't the only one. I said, Noah, who I'm preaching on today, was also a preacher. In fact, there was probably all sorts of preachers but very few who were faithful and true. Noah was a herald or a preacher of righteousness. And what was his message? By now, all of you should know, a flood is coming. 
The flood of God's judgment is coming. So you had better repent. You better repent and you had better believe and you better change your ways. You had better love God. You better love your neighbor. You had better live in righteousness before the Lord. Noah condemned the world. He rebuked the world. I dare say that there was probably no one else in his day who dared to do that or else they would have been on the ark with him. And I'm afraid that most preachers today don't do that either. Either, I suppose, they're too scared or they have fallen for the heresy of political correctness. They hear no evil and see no evil and say no evil. But Noah, he practiced what he preached. Genesis tells us Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. He walked with God. That doesn't mean he was perfect. Doesn't mean he was sinless. After the fall, the only one sinless and perfect is the Lord Jesus Christ. But like Enoch, Noah walked with God. His life was bent towards God, towards serving God and loving God. And I mentioned last week that word walk is the same word used in the Hebrew for God walking with Adam and Eve in the garden. That implies a relationship, fellowship. Like Enoch, Noah loved and served the Lord and walked with him. But you know, there was more to Noah's sermon than just his words. His life, too. That's why we are told he was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. That's why we are told he walked with God. Noah's sermon included his life. Look at me. That's how you should be living. His sermon included his 120 years of building a boat. And every time people heard him chop down a tree, every time they saw him cut a plank, every time they saw him smear and pitch, every time they saw him store away food for the animals and for the people, every time they saw him work on the ark, he was rebuking the world. Judgment is coming. God is angry with your sin. You need to repent. His life was a sermon. Now we all know why judgment was coming. The world needed to be condemned. And Genesis tells us what God saw, what God felt, and what God intended to do. What did God see? Genesis 6, verse 5, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God saw that man's wickedness is all over the earth. In other words, every man is wicked. No exception. Original sin has touched everyone. No one is excluded. There is wickedness and evil in every single heart. And that even includes man's thoughts. Man's thoughts are perverted and filled with evil. Every intention, every intention of the thoughts of his heart, every, not just some, not just a few, not just many, but every. And not just some of the time, not just part of the time, not just most of the time. But continually. That's what God saw and what did God feel about this. Genesis 6, 6, and the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Regret it. Grieved. Now, when we regret something, when we grieve about something, we have pain in our heart. 
the Lord God was grieved. He had pain in his heart that his image bearers had fallen, were so full of sin. He had pain. You know, we go back to Genesis chapter 3, right after Adam and Eve fell into sin. And God said to Eve, you're going to have pain in childbirth. And he said to Adam, you were going to have painful toil to get food from the earth. And now we see it's God's turn to have pain. And third, you already know what God is going to do. He's going to send judgment. He's going to send a flood. And we see here something about God and his response to sin. God's response to sin is not half measures. He deals fully with sin and with wickedness which is why he sent his flood, which is why destruction came upon Sodom and Gomorrah, which is why Pharaoh and his army were drowned in the Red Sea, which is why his people wandered around the wilderness for 40 years, which is why the heathen occupants of the promised land were destroyed, which is why his people were sent into exile for 70 years, and which is why finally he sent his one and only son to die on the cross for our sins. No half measures on the part of God when it comes to dealing with sin and wickedness and evil. By his faith, Noah condemned the world. For 120 years, he rebuked the world. For 120 years, he preached. For 120 years, people were given a chance to repent. And you might think God gave people way too much time to repent and reform. However, according to 1 Peter, God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. God waited patiently. Now that means he was waiting for something. What was God waiting for? One of my commentaries, and I had never ever realized this before, but one of my commentaries says God's patience was connected to Methuselah. Now the name Methuselah means, here's the interesting part, the name Methuselah means when he dies, it shall be sent. When it dies, it shall be sent. What is the it? The flood. Now, you know, Genesis has all of these generations that are listed. We're told that someone was born when he was such and such a year old. He would have a son. And then he would live to be so many years, and then he would die. And then the next person, and the next person, and the next person. And so I went through those, those genealogies. And did you know that Noah was still alive when Methuselah was? God waited patiently for Methuselah to die. And the flood did not start, when you add up those genealogies, the flood did not start until the year Methuselah died. Now why would God do this? Why would he wait so long? Why would he wait so patiently? Because he's a long-suffering God. According to Peter, he wants to give all an opportunity to repent. And in the same way, God is patient and long-suffering towards the godless today. I would say that 
probably our day is very close to being as wicked as Noah's day. How come Jesus hasn't returned yet? How come judgment hasn't happened yet? God is patient. Patient with the wicked, patient with you and me. And his patience, you need to realize, means salvation. God is so long-suffering and patient so that the gospel can be presented, so the elect can be converted and come to Christ. By faith, Noah condemned the world. For 120 years, he preached. For 120 years, he rebuked. For 120 years, people were told to repent. Year after year after year, people experienced the patience of God. So how many repented? Who God in the ark would know in his family? Not one. After 120 years of preaching, preaching righteousness, living righteously, after 120 years, not a single person repented. Wow. Talk about preaching until you were blue in the face. But Noah did this anyway, by faith. Our third point when we look at Hebrews is that Noah became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. And that certainly fits the description that I already looked at or mentioned from Genesis. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. Why was Noah declared to be righteous? We need to go back one verse in Genesis, Genesis 6, verse 8. Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Now that word favor should sound very familiar, should be striking bells in your ears. Because another word we can use for favor or translate for favor is grace, kindness, acceptance. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now Noah had no grace of his own. Grace is simply God's to give. Nothing in the sinner, nothing in Noah, nothing in you, nothing in me makes us worthy of grace. Noah was no different than any other son of Adam. Noah was just as bad as the rest. Let me remind you of what happened after the ark came to rest. After they were released from its confines and life went on as normal, Noah planted some grapes and he got drunk. And he exposed himself. Grace is not given to anyone who deserves it. It's given to undeserving sinners. God looked with favor. God looked with grace upon Noah and made a covenant with him. And Noah's response was faith. By faith, Noah became an heir of righteousness. By faith. You can't do it on your own. You need faith. Faith that God gives. And without faith, all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. All our righteous deeds, says Isaiah, are like filthy rags. But when we, like Noah, come to God in faith, then we receive the righteousness of God. Romans 3, 21. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus for all who believe. 
Are you righteous? You are if you have the faith of Noah. If you have faith in Jesus. We read this morning from question and answer 60 of the Heidelberg Catechism and it summarizes what God's word teaches about God's grace and our righteousness. How are you considered righteous with God or before God? Only by true faith in Jesus. And then the catechism goes on to describe our sin. Our conscience accuses us. We have sinned against all of God's commandments. We have not kept any of them. I'm inclined toward all evil. Nevertheless, out of sheer grace, what does God do? He grants and credits to me the perfect rash, satisfaction, righteousness, and holiness of Christ as if, as if I had never sinned or been a sinner, as if I had been as perfectly obedient as Christ was obedient for me. All I need to do is to respond, to accept this gift of God with a believing heart. By faith. Now let me end by saying Jesus wants us to learn from Noah. In Luke 17, Jesus teaches us, just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. Now what are the days of the Son of Man? That's today. Jesus is the Son of Man, and the whole time between his first and second coming are the days of the Son of Man. Now let me just explain that title real quick. Too many people think that they should focus on that word man, and it talks about Jesus being a man just like you and me. No. That title, Son of Man, comes from Daniel, and it refers to the glory, the heavenly majesty of who is about to come, even Jesus. The second person of the triune Godhead. Nothing to do with his humanity, rather everything to do with his divinity and his glory. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man today. What were they doing? They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Hear what Jesus is saying? The same thing he said to Noah and to the people of Noah's time. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming for all of your sin, all of your evil, your evil thoughts and words and deeds. Judgment is coming. How do you respond? Do you repent? Do you believe? For the only ones are, who are saved are those who, like Noah, have faith, who believe. Let us pray.